contrast godly ambition with ungodly ambition. And what we're going to talk about today is patience. If you are truly motivated with the right things, then you will have patience along the way. This will help you, so stay tuned for the gospel truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry emphasizing God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is my uh, fifth week, the end of the fifth week, teaching on how to be happy. And this week I've been contrasting godly ambition with ungodly ambition and talking about how that an ungodly ambition uh, is founded on discontentment. That's one of the main secrets that I've taught about happiness is that you have to learn to be content, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. And some people think, well, if I was content, why would I ever want to move on and do something more and accomplish things? If you get content, you get complacent. I don't think that contentment and complacency go together. I am super content in the Lord, but I am not complacent. I've got ambition, but it's not selfish ambition. So what I've been doing is contrasting what is selfish ambition versus godly ambition. And I talked about three things so far. First of all, an ungodly ambition is selfish. It's all about self. It's all about you having to accomplish certain goals for you to have self-esteem, self-worth, self-satisfaction. And that's absolutely wrong. You ought to find your contentment in the Lord and then go ahead and establish goals and accomplish things, not because you have to have that to feel good about yourself. You already are content with the Lord in the spiritual realm, who you are in Christ, but you are achieving goals because you believe that it brings honor to the Lord. You used your increased influence and uh, abilities to be able to bless other people. It's not selfish. And something that goes right along with that, the second thing we talked about is that if it is a godly ambition, you have contentment. You don't have to wait until you obtain your goals to be satisfied, but your satisfaction is in the Lord, so you have total contentment while you're in process, not just after you obtain your goal. Major point right there. If it is an ungodly ambition, you will embrace and accept discontentment as, well, I can't be happy until I obtain these goals. See, that's an ungodly ambition. No, you, you need to totally, constantly live in a state of contentment and satisfaction based on who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ, and you ought to be content. In other words, you enjoy the journey, not just the destination. The third thing that we talked about is that if it is an ungodly ambition, there will be fear of failure. You'll be paralyzed by fear that if I don't obtain this goal, what's going to happen to me? My life is over. Nothing is going to work. If that's the way that you feel, then you are motivated by ungodly ambition. If it is truly godly ambition, there's a satisfaction and a contentment. You know who you are, and your worth and value is separate from all of these other accomplishments. Your worth and value is rooted in Christ, and you're wanting to accomplish things not for yourself, but for other people. Major difference. You know, an example of this in the Bible is uh, David, the king of Israel. And he had ruled over Israel for nearly 40 years. It was towards the end of his life, and his own son Absalom rebelled and came with an army and was going to overthrow David and take over the kingdom. And so David had to flee Jerusalem for his life. And as he left the city, some of the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbol of God's presence and is very significant to the Jews. When they went out to battle, they always took the Ark of the Covenant with them. And so they brought this Ark of the Covenant, and they were going to escape with David. And David said, no, take the Ark of the Covenant back to where it, to its rightful place, to the uh, tent that he had pitched for it. And he says, if God is pleased with me and wants to bring me back and rule over the nation, then I will return to the ark. But if God is through with me and if he wants somebody else to rule over this nation, he says, you know, 
the ark needs to be there. He says, God do with me whatever he wants to do. Now see, that is a man who was content where he was. And if God was through with him and if the banner had passed on to somebody else and somebody else was going to be king, even if it meant his death, no problem. He was at peace with God where he was. And see, that's the attitude that when you have a godly ambition, I believe that David wanted to keep ruling because he recognized he was the one that God had called. He was the one that was anointed. Absalom was doing this thing totally incorrect. Absalom would not have been a blessing to that nation. It would have plunged it into more problems. And so David had ambition. David wanted to come back to Jerusalem and continue his rule as king. But by expressing that, you know, take the ark back, and if God's through with me, fine. But if God isn't through, then I'll return to it. You know what? That shows a, a um, lack of fear that a person who was just driven and his whole life was contingent upon all of his accomplishments and all of these things. You know, that's setting yourself up for failure. There's a lot of people that honestly find their identity in all of these things that they accomplish. And I'm trying to say you need to find your identity in Christ. Say, for instance, if a person, you know, if they start out as a kid and they aren't accepted by some other kids, and so the parents are having compassion on them because they're being made fun of or something. So you know what typically happens? We try and find something that the child is good at, and we help trying to build their self-esteem. Maybe it's gymnastics, maybe it's basketball, maybe it's football or something like that. And so the kid starts getting recognition and praise every time they succeed in one of these areas. So they put themselves into it. Their goal becomes... Uh, it, it becomes being uh, the world's greatest gymnast or the world's greatest basketball player, baseball player, football player, or whatever. And you know what? For a period of time, that can provide them with motivation and it can even provide them with self-esteem because they're accomplishing. But you know, if you're a gymnast, by the time you're 20, you're washed up. If you're a football player, by the time you're 25 or 30, you could be washed up. Or if you get an injury, you're washed up. If a person's identity is in all of these accomplishments and reaching these goals, then the moment you put your attention on that, you have started down a path that eventually is going to be a dead end because you are going to be washed up in a short period of time. Or if you're in the business realm, you might succeed for 50 or 60 years, but eventually you're going to take retirement. And if your whole self-worth is tied up in what you've accomplished, then you're headed for a dead end. You're headed for a train wreck. And that's where most people are living. I'm telling you that that is not godly ambition. You need to be content and, and know who you are in Christ and then succeed and set goals not so that you could feel good and have good self-worth. You already got that through Christ, but you are obtaining goals so that you can just fulfill God's will, so that you can use these talents to be a blessing to other people. Like David, you want to go back and be king because you believe you're a better king, but, you know, it's no problem. God's through with you, fine. You'll go on and do something else. There's a lot of people that are really all wrapped up in themselves and in this selfish ambition. You know, I heard a story about a guy who came, uh, he was on an airplane and his flight got canceled. And anyway, they uh, had to go stand in line at one of these service centers and uh, they had to reschedule and rebook. And this guy was a well-to-do person wearing these nice clothes and everything like that. And he just bypassed the line, went straight up to the counter and started talking to the woman. And the woman said, you're going to have to get to the back of the line and wait your turn like everybody else. And this guy said, do you know who I am? He says, how dare you treat me this way? Don't you know who I am? And this woman got on the, uh, you know, the PA system and she says, does anybody know who this man is? Apparently he can't remember. <laughs> and she just ridiculed him, humiliated him in front of the whole group and he walked off. You know what? That guy's identity was in all of these accomplishments and things like this. You need to find out who you are in Christ and not use your obtaining of certain goals and recognition and praise from man as the thing that makes you feel content and satisfaction. You need to find all of that in Christ. Well, that's power. I got so much to say. There's no way I could say this in another week. Let me hurry on to another point.
is that if you are in a selfish ambition type of thing, you won't have any peace. Now, this goes along with fear, being fearful of not obtaining the goal, but it's just a little finer definition that if you don't have peace in you, then you know what? You are using selfish motivation. You're, you're, you don't find your satisfaction and contentment in the Lord, but rather you've got to obtain these goals to have peace and be at peace with yourself and with other people. That's kind of a fine line here between that and, and feeling fear, but I believe that there's a distinction. And you know what? This is one of the things that I evaluate myself on constantly. I'm constantly analyzing, you know, am I letting the peace of God rule in my heart? And I find out that when I'm following the Lord and when I'm focused on the Lord the way I'm supposed to be, that there is a peace and contentment that goes along with doing things God's way. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Peace is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And you know what? When you are doing things God's way, when you are setting goals and moving towards marks in your life in a godly way, there will be peace along the way. There won't be this dissatisfaction and fear and discontentment that this world breeds on. Man, that is a powerful, powerful truth. And we're going to be sharing some other things. I'm going to take a break here because I want my announcer to share with you that today is our last day to be offering you the fifth teaching in this six-part series. And this fifth teaching is entitled, What About Ambition? And so today's our last day to make that our free gift to you. Now, we are going to continue to offer the album, the CDs, the uh, DVDs, and the cassettes on through next week's broadcast. But this is the last day for the fifth out of the sixth teaching entitled, What About Ambition? So listen as our announcer gives you that information, and I'll be right back after this break. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Be Happy, is available in a six-part album on tape or CD. It's also available in a DVD album recorded from television. Request album T1019 when you send a gift of 19 pounds or more to Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe. Be sure to specify tape, CD, or DVD album when you write or call. The fifth individual teaching in this album is also available on tape or CD. We suggest a donation of three pounds. But for those unable to give, Andrew and his partners will provide this fifth teaching free of charge. Make your check payable to AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. Our telephone number is 01922 473 300. Or you can go to our website at any hour. You can use credit card to make donations and receive ministry products 24 hours a day at www.awme.net. Thank you for your gift today. And now, Gospel Truth continues. So I've been contrasting godly ambition with ungodly ambition. Ungodly ambition is selfish. It is discontent, breeds on discontentment, embraces it, accepts it as you can't be content until you obtain all of your goals. It's petrified by fear. What happens if I don't obtain it? You don't have any peace in the process. And the next thing here is that it is impatient. An ungodly ambition is impatient, whereas if God is the one that is leading you, and if you aren't doing it out of selfish things, if you aren't doing it out of discontentment, if you aren't afraid of failure, if you've got peace along the way, then you know what? You can be patient. And there's a lot of scriptures, but in James chapter 1, it says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I could do an entire teaching here on patience, but patience is a powerful powerful force. It is a, a supernatural force. And if you are driven by godly ambition, well, then you're patient because really it's not your goal. It, you don't have to obtain this thing for you to be satisfied. You're doing it because you feel like it's what God wants you to do. You're doing it because you think it's beneficial to other people, but you're happy and content. And so you, you aren't uh, bothered by impatience. 
You know, one of the greatest examples in the Bible to me on this is Joseph. I'm not going to take over and read all of these scriptures, but you can, it starts in Genesis chapter 37, and it goes on through Genesis chapter 50, the story of Joseph. But in Genesis 37, Joseph was 17 years old when God gave him two dreams about what he was going to do in his life and how that Joseph was going to be in a position of leadership and so that people came down and bowed to him. Even his parents and his brethren bowed to him. So he got those dreams when he was 17 years old. And then for the next 13 years, until the time he was 30 years old, everything in Joseph's life went bad. He got sold into slavery. He was falsely accused of trying to commit uh, sin with the master's wife and put into prison. And just every step that he took was further down. It didn't look like these dreams were coming to pass. And yet Joseph remained faithful. But finally, after 13 years, when he was 30 years old, Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream. He was made the absolute master over Egypt. The only person who was higher in authority than him was Pharaoh. Joseph could do anything he wanted to. Now, let me just ask you, if you had ambitions, if you had dreams, goals, and part of those goals were to see your brothers bow down to you, and if you had remained faithful to God for 13 years until you saw you come into a position where now you had the power, you could make this come to pass, what would you have done? Well, you know what I probably would have done, what probably most of us would have done? We would have taken that position. We would have taken the soldiers. We would have gone back to Israel. We would have surrounded that family, and we would have taken the, the uh, might and the power, and we would have made them bow the knee. We would have made that dream come to pass. But you know one of the greatest traits about Joseph, and it's subtle, sometimes people don't see this, but one of the greatest things is Joseph was 30 years old when he became absolute Lord over Egypt and could have made his dreams come to pass. But he waited nine years, seven years through the years of plenty and two years through the drought until his brothers came down to him and then they bowed down and they worshiped him and he saw the fulfillment of those dreams. One of the greatest things about Joseph to me is that he was patient, that he waited on God to bring these visions to pass. Even after he had the ability in himself to make it happen, he was so God-dependent. He was so selfless in his ambition. See, those dreams, even though it involved his brothers and his father coming and bowing down to him, some people could have taken that as, boy, what a wonderful thing that is. But he didn't see it that way. He wasn't selfish with him. He saw it as he was being put into a position to where he could help people and stuff. And Joseph was not self-centered. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't angry. He didn't go down and take vengeance on his brothers for selling him into slavery. This man was patient because his ambition was all God-centered. And he even later said, after his father died, the brothers came to him and thought, now that our father is dead, Joseph is going to for sure kill us or put us in prison. And they came down and started begging for mercy. And he said, brothers, he says, you meant it for evil, but God sent me ahead to preserve many people's lives. He saw the positive thing. He was actually serving people by being in this position of authority. And he he actually, in a sense, was hurt that his brothers thought that he would take his position and use it against them because that wasn't his motivation at all. See, if you have godly ambition, you're going to be patient. If you're impatient, if you're the kind that would take your authority and go down and make things happen if it was in your power instead of waiting on God to bring it to pass, then you know what? It's selfish ambition. It's not a godly ambition. Oh, that's a powerful statement right there. That's a powerful statement. You know, in my own life, when I started into ministry, once I understood that God called me to ministry, I knew that someday I was going to have a worldwide ministry and one of the largest ministries in the world because I just felt like that's what God told me. So I started moving in that direction. But then for decades, decades, you know, I, God was just teaching me to cool my jets that I wasn't ready yet. 
and I pastored three little churches. And then even after I started ministering for, I don't know, nearly 20 years after I started traveling, I started traveling in, uh, well, it was 20 years. It was uh, January of 2008. And it was January of two, I mean, of, excuse me, not 2008. It was January of 1980 when I started traveling, and it was January of 2000 when I started on television. So for 20 years after I left the pastorate and I started moving into what God called me to do, you know what? God just kept telling me it's not time yet, and he was preparing me. And so I got into a mode to where... I was just patiently waiting. And finally, after I started on television, and we were still growing, I saw, I saw our ministry double from the year 2000 to 2002. But finally, January the 31st, 2002, the Lord spoke to me that I was limiting what he could do through me because I was thinking small. I had been in that mode of just being patient and waiting for so long that now I wasn't aggressive enough. There's a balance between these things that I'm teaching. And the Lord told me that I needed to start thinking bigger. I needed to take the limits off of God. And you know what? That just transformed our ministry from January of 2002 to January of 2007. Our ministry has increased over five times the size that it was about eight times as many people that we're reaching that are contacting us. And I tell you, awesome things are happening. So anyway, patience is one of the ways to tell whether you, your goals and you moving towards these goals is it a godly ambition or an ungodly ambition. If it's ungodly, then you'll be impatient. If you're impatient, you need to go back and find your contentment in the Lord, your satisfaction in Him, and start moving making sure, first of all, that your goals are God-ordained goals and not selfish goals. And then if they're God-ordained, then you can be patient because you're content and happy the way you are. The last thing I want to uh, bring out here is that if you, if you are driven by your goals, by your ambition, I mean, if they dominate you and control you instead of you controlling them, then I believe that's one way to tell that it's an ungodly ambition. If you are truly having a godly ambition, then there will be this patience, there will be this contentment, there will be this satisfaction, there will be this peace. You won't be terrified. And you will, you know, even though you have goals and stuff, that's not what your whole life is about. I don't know if I'm connecting with you, but I have seen people that literally are so consumed with obtaining a goal. That's what their whole life is about. They are driven by it. They run over people. They lose their sense of um, perspective. They get upset over the slightest little thing. They abuse people. They violate their own standards. You know, I've had a lot of things come that have tried to get me to compromise in order to obtain a goal. I remember about 20 years ago that we were struggling financially and I was in Phoenix, Arizona and I had these people come in from California, Tulsa, Dallas, Fort Worth. My media buyer brought them all together and these people had just raised $22 million for another ministry. They guaranteed me that they could raise me $2 million. And back then, $2 million was more than a year's income. And you know what? I was tempted. I said, I'll meet with you. And I listened, and I said, well, I could sure use the money. But when they got to telling me what they would do to raise that money, I said, those things are false. I don't do this. It, it'd be misrepresenting. And they said, who cares? We guarantee you $2 million. And you know what? I wound up kicking them all out. I ran them out, and I said, you know what? I, I've got principles that to me are more important than just obtaining this goal. I wasn't driven by trying to reach a place so much so that I would compromise things along the way. And yet I know that there are people watching this program right now that you maybe have a promotion coming up, but to do it, you're going to have to compromise. And there are some of you that are driven towards this success to the point that you would even contemplate compromising and doing things against your commitment to the Lord. I'm telling you, that is an ungodly ambition. You need to kill that. I've got more to say, but you know what? I'm out of time, and today is our last day, and so we're going to end this teaching entitled, What About Ambition? Now, this is just the fifth 
out of six teachings that I've got in this series. We're going to continue this teaching on how to be happy next week. But today is our last day to offer you the fifth teaching in this series entitled, What About Ambition? So please listen as our announcer gives you that information and call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Be Happy, is available in a six-part album on tape or CD. It's also available in a DVD album recorded from television. Request album T1019 when you send a gift of 19 pounds or more to Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe. Be sure to specify tape, CD, or DVD album when you write or call. The fifth individual teaching in this album is also available on tape or CD. We suggest a donation of three pounds. But for those unable to give, Andrew and his partners will provide this fifth teaching free of charge. Make your check payable to AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. Our telephone number is 01922-473-300. Or you can go to our website at any hour. You can use credit card to make donations and receive ministry products 24 hours a day at www.awme.net. Thank you for your gift today. I've got many, many more materials on this subject than what I'm able to promote here on this program. I would like to direct you towards our website. And I have like 300 plus of my sermons available as free downloads. You can get them MP3 downloads. I tell you, I've got a wealth of material on there. I've also got books. I've got articles that I've written. We have about seven years worth of my television on there, probably eight years or more of our radio program on there. All of this is free. It's a great website. So join us at awme.net. Be sure to tune in Monday for more gospel truth. If you really thought about that, I guarantee you fears would subside, worries would leave, all of your anxiety about the future. I mean, just so many things that most people and even many Christians deal with on a continual basis that keep them from being happy. Those things would just totally melt away if you were to just stop and think about the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ will never leave you nor forsake you. That's Monday on Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. How will God provide for you at Karis Bible College? Oh, Lord. I had enough money to come from Hawaii to Colorado Springs. I came out with um, enough finances to, to just get started. My wife and I quit our jobs, come up here with no job in mind. Trusted God to provide an apartment and he found us the perfect apartment. He's provided everything I've needed, just like he has for everybody else here. Because if he calls you, he's gonna equip you. The first day I came here, I had a place to stay. I had, and uh, got a job but the Lord provided every bit of it from A to Z. And if God wants you to come here, He will give you everything you need to come. The Lord was faithful. Ever since then, God has just been blessing and providing. It's been awesome. And so I came to school with a smile on my face. Go to our website at www.awme.net and click on the Bible College link or call our helpline at 01922 473 300. 